Uh, so it's 9.30, so we can go ahead and get started. Um, so the speaker we'll be hearing from next is Dina Zarka, um, talking about flexible word order in a contact situation. Uh, take it away. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear yeah? you. Yeah, okay. Great. Um, okay, thanks, uh, first of all, for having me present this rather preliminary study on flexible word order in Arabic varieties in, in the Persian speaking environment in contact with Persian. So this is work to, uh, joint work with my colleague Sandra. And this study was kind of a, oh, no, it's not moving, okay. Kind of a pilot project to a larger documentation project of um, the Arabic varieties in Southern Iran, uh, which have not been described yet. And the project just started uh, this August and is being funded by the Austrian Science Fund. So here you can see a, a map of Iran and uh, the yellow and green spots you see are <clears throat> the places where Arabic is spoken in Iran. And uh, what you immediately see is to the, in the Southwest, you find the province, Khuzestan, which is predominantly Arab. Uh, and then in the other places, Arab is, Arabic is, is more scattered and, and the number of speakers is lower. So the, the, uh, the places where we do our research are here down in the South, uh, along the Persian Gulf Coast, in two provinces, Bushehr and uh, Hormuzgan. Specifically for the present study, we chose four field sites, four villages, and the two, uh, two in, with red circles farther to the north are places where um, Arabic has receded to a high extent and uh, there's only a no small number of speakers left. And then in further to the south, uh, Arabic is more vivid and there is um, a higher number of speakers. So I will be referring to this during the talk. Um, uh, now, as far as the background for this study is concerned, uh, all our speakers are bilingual there. So younger speakers uh, uh, even have Persian as a dominant language, and this might even be true for some older speakers in certain locations. And there's a lot of code switching going on. And um, yeah, and even within families, Sometimes uh, people use Persian instead of Arabic, partly at least. Uh, as far as word order is concerned, as we've heard today uh, before in the first talk, um, that uh, Arabic is a, a Semitic language and has a VSO word order, at least classical Arabic, which is uh, still preserved in modern standard Arabic, the written uh, variety, but the modern spoken varieties are quite flexible, at least as far as um, VS and SVs are concerned. But there is basically no OV structures in, in Arabic varieties um, across the Arab Peninsula, Arabian Peninsula and in, in Africa. So, but uh, by contrast, word order in Arabic varieties that are in contact with OV languages, that means Iranian and Turkic languages, we can find in Central Asian Arabic. So for example, in Uzbekistan and Afghanistan. Um, and there you find a complete switch to OV. And also in the province to the North e in the Northeast of Iran, uh, the change seems, seems to be very advanced. So according to the texts we have, we don't have much information about that area, but, but according to the texts, um, it, it has also changed. There is a dominant uh, word order OV. And even for Khuzestan, you remember that's the green province where Arabic is really dominant. Uh, Matras and Shabibi have suggested that uh, there is a beginning shift already. And, uh, but Leitner in a more recent study on language contact in that area, um, she, uh, she, di she did not find any OV structures. The only thing she found is some occurrences of sentence final copulae and sentence final auxiliaries. That means in complex predicates, the lexical verb and then the auxiliary would occur. So now the hypothesis for our study are the following. We, th we think that, or we thought, <laughs> and still think, that the, that the shift uh, is more advanced in uh, southern varieties, and specifically where the number of speakers is lower. 
So this is what we tried to test here or wanted to see. But of course, um, there are also other factors influencing uh, word order, um, not only language contact. And so we, we tried to look in this very small amount of data, as you will see, um, at, at different, different other um, factors that could, that could influence that. Now, uh, our materials are just four short conversations or interviews, sociolinguistic interviews, basically, from the four places. Everything was recorded in March 2017 in our up-to-date um, first and only field trip. So we don't have much data, as I said. We only have 905 IPs here, which we annotated. And we made 505 annotations of verbs or verb-like constituents and their complements and so far. Um, so um, here is a simplified annotation scheme. We made more fine-grained annotations, but to be able to say anything in terms of frequency counts, we had to collapse some categories. So um, we have syntactic uh, annotation. We, we wanted to see how a direct object behaves. And then we have this other category where we have indirect objects, but also adjuncts um, and some other stuff. And then this is the interesting uh, category, which we call complement here, because we mean complement of a copula. As uh, you might remember, in the beginning, I said that uh, Bettina Leitner found in Khusistan some uh, sentence finest copula, so we wanted to see how this behaves uh, in the South. And then we have possessive and existential constructions, uh, where a, a possessive construction in Arabic does not have a a, a, a verb to have, but is kind of a prepositional phrase that functions like a pseudo verb. The semantics, for the semantics, we coded uh, undergoer, that means patients and themes basically. And then we had separate annotations for goals, recipients and source, uh, because we have some predictions there, I'll be talking about that later. Finally, we also annotated information status and definiteness. For information status, we took Chafe's classification and um, we annotated given, accessible, and new. And uh, for the sake of being operationalizable, uh, we, we just said that given was everything that was, that, uh, was mentioned in the utterance right before the utterance we're looking at. Then we also annotated the auxiliary and the lexical verb to see how these behave. In the end, we had to exclude many annotations for the frequency counts then because pronominal objects um, cannot be um, looked at here because pronominal obje objects in Arabic are inherently postverbal as their suffixes. So we had to exclude 131 objects. <clears throat> somehow it doesn't move. Okay. Now the overall results. No, okay, sorry. Um, my, uh, the overall results show that there might still be the dominant ver word, word order um, VO as expected from Arabic, but there is a fair number of XV structures. So 23% of all structures we found were indeed XV, which is really out in Arabic varieties uh, on the mainland. And if we look at the distribution across the sites, we also find that our prediction seems to be correct. In the low density area, the red, the red one, we find more such structures, 35% to 40%, um, the two speakers, and then only 11% and 25% in the high density area. Um, as far as syntactic functions are concerned, we don't find very interesting um, observations about direct objects and the other category because they behave like the overall, like similarly to the overall results. But what is really interesting is this complement category. Uh, and we'll zoom into that later to see how that behaves. Um, maybe just one remark about the direct objects. Um, it looks as, as if they were 
about 20% direct objects in pre-verbal position, but they're mostly, or many of them are due to one speaker um, who is more advanced in this respect and other speakers have much less uh, proportion of, of OV structures. Now, as far as the verbs are concerned, uh, you can see that the traditional word order would be auxiliary lexical verb, and that's still the more frequent uh, structure, but it's only 60 to 40. So we have the uh, uh, verb auxiliary structures in 40% of the cases, which is quite a lot. Now, I'll show you an example here. Um, for a direct object, one of the rare ones, um, here the female speaker tells us about how she did those things in her household or she used to do it when she was young and then she she says um saulimat asawi asawi is the verb so i make and then the direct object com comes right before that and what is interesting about this example and the other examples in the corpus is that um the verb is always kind of a light verb so a semantically not rich verb like make or put or anything like that. And we only have one example for a semantically rich verb with an object before it. Now let's zoom in into the, this complement um, category. Um, here you can see that actually it is due to the copular clauses that, um, that we have more XV structures a high number of XV structures in, in this category, which is even, so in, 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 in as far as the comp, uh, copular clauses are concerned, we even have a preponderance of verb final uh, clauses. And then the, the next category, existentials, is also almost equal and possessives next. And zooming in even more, for the four speakers or field sites, you see that three of the speakers already sh sh uh, use more copular final clauses than non-final clauses. There's one speaker, the third one here, I and M. Um, he has the tradi more traditional way of talking. He's an old speaker and he's from a highly, highly, um, from, from, an area, from an area where there are many Arabs living. And another interesting thing is this final speaker, JKM. We also saw him on, on the first slide with the 25% overall structures in a, high, in a highly, uh, high, in a dense population area. And this speaker uh, even has a preponderance of existential and possessive constructions with this expression in the final position. And if you compare this with the two other male speakers, which is the first one and the third one here, uh, you can see that they have zero structures like this. They don't use it at all. So that means age also seems to play a role. Uh, now let's look at the semantic roles. Undergoer again behaves as expected and goal also behaves as expected because um, we know from, for example, work by Jeff Haig on Iranian languages in the area, uh, which are OV, um, that most of them or many of them have a statistical tendency to have the goal uh, after the verb. So it's not surprising that Arabic, which normally would have the goal after the verb, really expresses it mostly in this case. And we'll look at cases where this is not the case and how you can explain them later. The same is true in the Iranian languages for recipients, but the number of recipients in our data is so low, it's difficult to say anything about that. But in comparison with an equally low number of sources, you can see that um, recipients are more often after the verb and sources are more often pre-verbal in a pre-verbal position, somehow iconically mirroring the cognitive flow. So in utterances that, that have a source and a goal in the utterance, the source is often placed before the verb and then after the verb, the goal comes. Now again, I show you two examples to give an impression how that works. So in this lady here says that 
every two or three years she got pregnant. So, she, so what she says is kilsintin salasa ham farchai chanit. Farchai, which is pregnant, and then chanit in the uh, sentence final position. By contrast, you find a goal in post-verbal position as expected here from another speaker. Let's go to Qatar, uh, which is butar. Now, we also annotated information status and definiteness. But on their, on, on their own, the annotations did not, were not very telling. But if we take information status or re uh, referential status as a basis to infer the information structure of a sentence, um, we might explain some things like goals that are, that are uh, realized pre-verbally like here. So here the context is, again, our lady speaker had told us in the utterance before that she puts garlic into the meat dish. So garlic, basal som, and also the meat dish, the meat, in the meat is given, and then we can analyze this as a theme. So she starts out from basal, basal som, fil laham, man hatti. We don't put it, so this is the ring. So it seems that there is a, co a competition between where to put the goal and information structure, where what is the theme and what is the ream, and it seems that in this case, information structure wins out. Here is another example from information structure, a narrow focus. So we've heard a lot about focus before and also about narrow focus, and I don't have to explain. So one typical way to, um, in many languages to realize a narrow focus is with a strong accent if we do it with intonation and uh, then uh, deaccentuation afterwards. But another typical way is also to have it in the pre-verbal slot. So this is, seems to be um, um, both, right? We have many, we found quite many narrow focus um, constituents pre-verbally. And here uh, you can see that this emphatic pronoun that like we made it ourselves, which is in contrast to others who had helpers, um, is realized with this strong accent and then, then the deaccented part afterwards. And my final example now show, shows another narrow focus, uh, again in the same position and also the intonation is, is, is similar. Um, and this is uh, the context here is that some, the speaker talked about his grandfather and that his grandfather was moving here and there around everywhere. And then in the end, he settled there. So this there, although it's a goal, is also realized in pre-verbal position. Okay, to sum up and conclude, um, this, as I have to emphasize again, very preliminary study because we don't have so many data, so much data, um, is actually shows that there seems to be a beginning shift in word order. And it also shows that it's similar to Khuzistan, but stronger and starts from the same constructions, namely the copular constructions, but also the complex verb constructions, also other dummy verbs. Um, that have not been uh, mentioned by Leitner for Khuzistan, for example. And we even have uh, occurrences of pre-verbal uh, pre objects, uh, even direct objects, but this seems to be restricted maybe to light verbs and to narrow focus contexts. And we also uh, uh, can find the expected influence of semantic roles that posts are realized post-verbally. Now, um, this, as I said, is preliminary because it's only a qualitative analysis. We would really like to do a statistical analysis with much more, much more data where we can put everything as factors and have also sociolinguistic variables. And this will hopefully be possible now as our project has been funded and we can uh, gather more data. And thank you very much for your attention. And this is the, some references. Great, thank you so much, Dina, for the really interesting talk. Um, so yeah, we have a few minutes for questions. So as usual, um, 
can raise your hand or you can just type it in the chat if you have any plans. Right, so we've got a question from Eva. Uh, you can go ahead whenever you're ready. Yeah, thank you very much for that really interesting, um, well, for me, an update of your work. Um, can you tell us a bit more about the copula construction? I find it really intriguing that this should be more susceptible to um, syntactic influence from a contact language. Okay. So, um, from the very little I know about Persian, it's the copula is very much prosodically integrated with the complement, isn't it? So would you find the same kind of prosodic integration mirrored in the Arabic variety? Um. Yes, I think so. Yeah, um, I, I think, well, it's, it's too early to say that I'm not sure about that, but I have the, the impression that the intonation is largely, um, is, is very much under, under Persian influence. So we actually have uh, the, this integration into one prosodic phrase with, with the uh, uh, final copula and uh, as you said, that you find it funny that it should be borrowed. Um, I think, I think Yaron Matras mentioned that it's it's borrowed very easily a verb a, a close final copula, and definitely in this area in in uh, in Iran, it it seems to be an aerial feature. So Jeff Haig says that it's an in, in, an aerial feature across the Iranian languages and even the Semitic languages there. Um, the Neo-Aramaic languages uh, spoken in Iran, although they're also Semitic, also have it. And yes, it's, it's internationally really similar. I don't know how to, how to close my presentation or have I closed it already? Okay, Jeff. Um, it's still on the screen. Um, I think you. Yeah. Well, my my computer somehow um, is struggling with something. I don't know. I cannot do anything. Sorry. I think I'll be able to stop it. Myself. Yeah, please. Well, we have a question from Evan saying, um, "Do you have any thoughts on why JKM was behaving differently from the other speakers?" Um, I think because JKM is younger. I think that he has already, we have even another younger speaker who's not in this study. Um, he shows even more influence from, uh, from Persian than, than JKM. JKM is about 40 and the others are about 60, 65, something like that. Um, we also have a question from Savi, um, if you want to go ahead. Oh, I don't know. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. <laughs> I can't see myself. Um, so I wasn't sure if I was there. So thank you so much for this talk. It was super interesting. I'm wondering, um, and this might just be uh, question, you know, that you might not be able to answer uh, yet. But um, with these, uh, I'm thinking again about like what the, it seems like the, the locus of this like burgeoning change is coming from. And it, like you said, coming from these light verbs. Um, have you noticed that they're, like, does it seem like they're coming from some type of fixed expression? So I'm curious about if there are certain verbs um, and or verb object pairs or things like yeah, that. Exactly. This is what I, uh, this is also my suspicion that there are so many in, in, in Persian, there are many light verb constructions and uh, these light verb constructions always have this uh, make, many of them have, they have different light verbs and, uh, but, but make is something very, very prominent, very, very fre frequent. So I guess that that's the reason exactly the, the same is true for the copula. So that's, that's very, a very frequent construction. And I think this can be borrowed easily. So it, it, it seems that 
there are certain constructions that are borrowed first and then uh, in, in certain pragmatic contexts and then by time they, 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 they are not that restricted anymore and spread until word order sometimes. So word order is not, does not shift wholesale in, in one, um, yeah, not, not at once. So the salient constructions, and these are, I think, quite salient, quite frequent constructions, they seem to be borrowed first and then that's how it starts. I guess that's really exciting. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I'm just like, you know, anecdotally noticing similar things um, in, in my, in my data on Malayalam and English, where it's like, you get like things like I think, or I like um, being SVO order um, in uh -huh. a way that, uh, and because Malayalam is OV and then you get, anyway, um, yep. so similar type of thing going on. That's really exciting to see that uh, across mm -hmm. languages. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So I really can't wait to see the rest of this work. It's really <laughs> Thank you. Oh, Ava has another question. Sorry. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah, I guess it's a follow up comment on something you said yourself, which is that um, the um, Persian varieties in that area may actually have post verbal um, constructions like um, goal complements. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I guess <laughs> to get a really fine grained picture, one would have to do sort of case studies of the local varieties of Persian alongside yes. the other. Yes, definitely. And even other Iranian languages may be spoken in the area, right? We have not had any chance to, to, to look into that, but, but this is definitely on, on the agenda, yeah. And if Mark is correct with what he presented earlier today, then you only need like 2,000 clauses. Yeah. Or yes get a reliable picture so it's kind of reassuring yeah sure yeah and i i think that um we we might also if we if we ask um the project jeff haig is, is working on so um because our partners in iran are also worked with jeff and they also work with um um with uh, eric annenby in canada and they have they have a lot of data about the Iranian varieties, so maybe in the future we will contact them, and then it would be easier to get to get data also. Um, okay, so we have a question from Sunhi Park uh, asking. Uh, thanks for your interesting talk. I was wondering if you had analyzed the data in terms of definiteness or animacy of the arguments. Uh, you excluded the pronouns in the analysis already, but if you have other linguistic contexts that uh, provide definiteness, such as like Dexis. Yes, we, uh, we annotated definiteness. We did not annotate uh, animacy, but definiteness definitely we did. And there was on, on, on its own, it, it didn't, uh, it doesn't tell us anything. Just, well, I have to say, this is again, something which is, um, I have no idea yet, but it seems that the definite marker um, is not used as in other Arabic varieties. So what you expect to be a definite, de definite noun phrase um, is, is sometimes does, lacks this definite marker. So we, I don't know yet how, I cannot say anything about that. But as what, what we annotated, the definite markers that we could find, um, yeah, it did, this didn't tell us anything about that. It was just the same between XV and V, the X structures. So we, we, cause we had the, the hypothesis that given, given, um, given constituents would be, um, would maybe be pre-verbal and would be definite, where, whereas um, post-verbal would be more indefinite, but we didn't find anything like that. And animacy is, is still something we really have to look in. Mm -hmm. 
happened to, definitely. And yeah, we excluded pronouns, only the object pronouns that are suffixed, because then you cannot say it's, it's VO, it's, it has to be VO. So this is why, we, but we did not exclude the other pronouns, which could be pre-verbal. Pre Okay. okay, yeah. So I'm gonna um, uh, take over here because our next speaker is Alex. Uh, so thank you, Dina, uh, very much. And then we have our final two talks. 